What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Today we start a new series on everyday grace. We are exploring how we can find a little grace in every day of our lives. It's not lost on me that the name of our church is also grace, so maybe along the way we are thinking some about how the church can be a part of our lives too. In this new season with the church, we can open ourselves up and experience God's grace more and more. We are going to journey through the scriptures to better understand grace, and we start at the very beginning. Noel is going to read for us from the book of Genesis. God has created the world, chosen humans to oversee the creation, and then not too far along into this experiment, people have fouled it up pretty good. Uh, Adam and Eve's sin reminds us that we can all mess up, that we can be so wrapped up in our own perspective we fail to honor God and fail to do what's good for the world. After Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, things go from bad to worse. Adam and Eve have, a, uh, have children, and Cain murders his brother Abel and leaves home in shame. But even this is only a shadow of how bad it gets. As humanity expands, people become wicked to the point that seemingly even God has lost hope in people. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Let's hear the story for ourselves from Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. The Lord, the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. These are the descendants of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. And with a changed reading now from Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39, for as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Lord, help us to be uh, people who better understand your grace and to show it to others. As you were graceful to Noah, may we be graceful to one another. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Several weeks ago, I had the chance to spend some time with my family in Acadia National Park. It was actually the first time I was ever in a national park, and it was absolutely glorious. National parks are preserved because of how unique the landscape is and how beautiful it can be. That was certainly true at Acadia. Our first evening, we were right on the water of the bay, and there was this remarkable, perfect sunset that lit up the sky in a brilliant red. It only lasted for a few minutes, but with these amazing mountains, the scenery was just incredible. I also saw for the first time a hawk uh, scoop a uh, fish out of the water and, and carry it with its talons. That bird in two minutes uh, was more successful at fishing than me and Davy were all week, uh, but that didn't wreck our fun. Instead, we found other incredible parts to the park. We took a nature cruise and saw seals basking on an island. We had lobster at Bar Harbor, and perhaps my favorite part of all, we hiked to the top of a mountain. 
I love hiking, and I love hiking to unique and beautiful destinations even more. This particular climb was to something called Bubble Rock. Apparently, glaciers can carry boulders over hundreds of miles, and where they land can be quite random. This one is on the edge of a cliff at the top of this mountain. As we were hiking toward the rock, though, we had to go up some pretty intense rock scrambles. I wasn't even sure my son Hal was going to make it, but... Man, sometimes kids can be like little spiders, can't they? He just kept working at it and found holds everywhere. He needed one and made it up a solid eight feet in the air. As we picked our way up the last few twists and turns, we came back toward the lake we had just hiked by and had this amazing view. There were several people here, and they were all congratulating themselves on making the hike up to the top and taking a picture with Bubble Rock. But as I looked at it, I thought, this isn't right. The rock is supposed to be on the edge of the cliff. I looked around and noticed that there was another trail marker. There was still more to the trail. So I called Hal over, and we walked maybe 500 more feet, turned another corner, and had this unbelievable sight. Bubble rock almost looks like if you just gave it a hard enough shove, it would fall right off the edge. It was incredible. Hal was so excited to do this hike that when we came home, the very first thing he wanted to do was go hiking again. Uh, Since our trip, though, I just haven't been able to get bubble rock out of my head. So many people hiked so far and got so close. Sure, the lake is is beautiful, but I just couldn't believe how many people never made it to the actual bubble rock. They were content to get to this tiny, rather unspectacular rock near the top, but not the extra 500 feet to the real summit and the real prize. And this event makes me wonder just how many times we are content with something that's nice when spectacular is right around the corner. I love that nature can remind us of God's grace. It is a blessing to enjoy a sunset or climb a mountain. This is a touch of God's grace that surrounds us every single day. And all we have to do to receive it is to stop and pay attention. But maybe we're just a little too comfortable. I've shared before about the importance of being in nature. Two hours a week in nature can bring a a wealth of health benefits, like reducing stress and giving you better sleep, but it can be even bigger than that. Time in nature can make us feel connected with God and the world around us. It can give us a sense of vibrancy and awe. I know for me, being in the unique environment of Acadia reminded me of just how big and beautiful and amazing this world is. A place so unique and beautiful was just a few hours away, and I didn't even know it. There is this incredible blessing so close to us. It surrounds us, and all we have to do is pause to embrace it. That's it. But how often do we think to ourselves, oh, I can do that some other day. It will still be there tomorrow, and we just miss what God has for us. I wonder about the people Noah was surrounded by. Maybe like me, you think in ancient times they must have had it so much easier being so close to nature. There was so much less in the way that just a few steps out your front door, you could be surrounded by natural beauty. There was no concrete jungle to stop you from touching the dirt and breathing in the pine. Yet these people were very destructive. We know two things about the people in Genesis 6. The first is that the inclination of their hearts is continually on evil. That word for evil is sort of a funny one. It's a word related to shepherds. What's in mind are the sheep eating the grass. We might think of different animals today, but when a sheep eats grass, it bites to the very end of the blade of grass. There is practically nothing left. It is complete ruination for the plant. For me, I think of deer. Uh, We have maybe a dozen deer living in the woods not far from here. Three of them are seven-point buck for our hunters out there, and they are out on the field behind us every day. My house is on the other side of the field, and it does not matter what we plant. The deer will eat it. Uh, Deer-proof plants sprayed with repellent, 
it does not matter. They still mow it all down anyways. The only thing we've ever successfully planted in our yard was when we let my son Hal pick the plants. Of course, he picked something out called a black dragon, and his mother did not approve of the way this plant looked, and you know this is the only plant that survives on our yard, right? Uh, Our yard is a smorgasbord for those deer. They eat everything, and though I don't fault the deer for eating, that is the kind of destruction described in the book of Genesis. They just keep wrecking everything they touch. It does not matter what lessons are taught or rules are set up. They bulldoze right over it and ruin everything. Does that sound like some people you might know? The second thing we know about these people is their violence. The idea here is of maiming and killing, yes, but also that there is a, a total lack of moral restraint. The people are just doing whatever they want destroying whatever they want, killing indiscriminately, and it is absolutely ravaging the planet. When you put these two ideas together, you can see how dire the situation is. Not only are people living in terror, with death everywhere, the world around them is being destroyed too. What hope is there for the planet when people live this way? I can sort of understand God's remorse as God says to Noah, I am sorry that I have made them. And he says he will blot them from the earth. Sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? As though God is punishing everyone for the evil of just a few. It's like the TikTok mom who got arrested the other week. She would post videos saying how she wouldn't feed her children as punishment for not doing chores or misbehaving. She had millions of followers online, and then she gets arrested when her child literally escapes from the house malnourished with duct tape wrapped around the child's arms. It does not matter what thing that kid was doing wrong. You cannot punish people that way. Or maybe it's like the mother who says, I love all my children equally, or, or except for the one that sleeps, I actually love that one more. Come on, mom, you can't have favorites like that, right? We think God isn't allowed to accept some broken people, but not others. You have to accept everyone, even the violent ones equally, right? Destroying the earth seems like total overkill, no matter how bad it might be. But actually, I don't see God indiscriminately and angrily crushing these evildoers with a massive flood. I see God acting to save the earth from this unrelenting destruction. God has provided this beautiful world, and there is a kind of grace available to us every day through it. I've had enough Bible studies with some of you to know exactly what the Reverend Judy Ann White's husband, Roger, would say on this point. He would tell us God created it all and said, hey, this is pretty good stuff. But if we destroy it, if we wreck this pretty good stuff, we have cut ourselves and others off from this grace available to us every day. We are ruining what God intends to be a blessing to all people. It's not all bad news in the scripture, though. Sure, people are violent, and God moves to stop it, but we also hear that there is one person whose actions are pleasing to God. This person is Noah, and it is the first time grace is mentioned in the whole Bible, but Noah found favor or grace in the sight of the Lord. There's actually a really simple definition for grace that I love. Grace is anything that we are drawn to. So in the Bible, a necklace is described as having grace. It's beautiful, it's expensive, we are drawn to it, so it is a graceful necklace. The Bible also says a poet has lips of grace. Her words draw us in. One more example from the Bible, a deer is described as graceful. Maybe they eat too many of your flowers, but at least as they uh, move through your yard, they are full of grace. So that's what the scripture is saying about Noah. God is drawn to Noah. God watches Noah and is pleased, but what does that have to do with us? It's nice that God liked Noah, but what about us today? Why does it matter? And I think the implication might be bigger here than we realize. 
some people will look at this story and see God destroying things and say, oh, look how awful God is. But they've missed the point entirely. If you do the calculation of how much water is needed to flood the earth, it's about two and a half times as much water as there is on the entire planet. So the story is clearly not supposed to be taken in an exact and literal way. What is actually happening here is that despite how bad things might get, God reveals belief in this world. God is saying that no matter how bad it gets, this world is worth treasuring. And Noah pleases God uh, as he too treasures it. When, God, uh, when Noah builds an ark to save people and animals, God is commending him. Yes, here is a man that has a heart like God's heart. God is not angry his plan is wrecked, so now he's upset and punishing folks. No, this is God working toward a positive, sustainable world. God sees a man of grace who will build up the world, and God likes it. That's some pretty good stuff. If the people just keep going, left to their own devices, there would be no earth left. God intervenes to set the course of the world back on track. And Noah is following suit. We didn't read the rest of the story, but after the animals are in the ark and the rain comes, Noah is stuck with these animals for half a year. Could you imagine that? Finally, the ark settles on the top of a mountain and it takes months before the water recedes. Noah has to be patient with the world around him. It doesn't all just get fixed overnight. It takes time. I think this is important for us today. If we are going to become people of grace, we need to take these first steps like in the story of Noah. We need to embrace the world around us, embrace the earth God has given us. Sometimes that just means spending time in nature, breathing it in. It might even mean we need to advocate for open spaces and to keep places with nature and them close by to us. But most of all, I think our patience is going to be the key thing for us. When the world is not what we want it to be, when we see terrible things happening, we work for good in this world, joining in with what God wants, and we are patient like Noah on that ark. When I first came to Grace to be your pastor, I was only here a couple of weeks before there was a death in the congregation. Rebecca was only 35 years old when she died. I was in touch with her uncle who said, you know, Rebecca was an outdoors person. She had loved 4-H growing up, and he wondered if we had a space for her funeral that might be more fitting. And I said, well, we have the Grove. Our Boy Scouts had just recently remade this space with crosses, benches, and mulch. And for the first time I thought, the first time I saw it, I thought it was a beautiful space. So he said yes, and we held our funeral outside in the back there. We sang songs and told stories about her life. We shared about her mother, who had been such a faithful member for so long and how much she loved the nursery school. We talked about Rebecca's children and how hard things would be for them. He told me afterward, this was absolutely perfect. This was the right place to remember her. Being surrounded by God's creation was one way to let grace enter into a situation that was so heartbreaking. It was the start of healing. Rebecca's life was not perfect, but our church extended grace to her and her family time and time again. This church provided a little nature and a lot of patience to help heal people. Let's end with this. Uh, Rhea Zakich was forced not to speak for months after her doctor found polyps on her vocal cords. Although they were removed and she made a full recovery, she would write what she wanted to say on cards and it would take her a long time. Her responses were often slower than she wanted. But because of this, she learned to slow down and to be patient. One day her son Dean came home from school shouting, I hate my teacher. I'm never going back to school again. Before her surgery, she would have snapped back. Of course you are, even if I have to drag you there myself. But after learning patience from surgery, she waited. In a few moments, her angry son put his head in her lap and poured out his heart. Oh, Mom, I had to give a report, and I mispronounced a word. The teacher corrected me, and all the kids laughed. I was so embarrassed. 
Rhea wrapped her arms around her son. He was quiet for a few minutes, then sprung out of her arms. I'm supposed to meet uh, Jimmy at his house. Thanks, Mom. And he left. Her silence had made it possible for her son to confide in her. He didn't need a critique or a correction. He needed someone to listen. This seems to be a growing need in our world. We see violence and destruction and assume God needs us to speak out and demand changed behavior. But perhaps what we really need is the first step toward grace, a listening ear to receive what this world has for us. Nature teaches us this gift from God, one available to us from the very beginning. Amen? Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.